West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com When I sat down with Florida high school teacher Tatiana Album just before the school year began, she walked me through the official state education department training on the subject of slavery. The only thing I can find in this slide, in this entire presentation about enslaved people, it's one slide and it says less than 4% of slavery in the Western Hemisphere was in colonial America. The number of enslaved people increased in America through birth. What are what is happening here in the slide? Yeah, so this is a map um, kind of showing how the transatlantic slave trade brought enslaved people to both of the Americas. There's a heavy emphasis that those people were brought to South America. It's a much bigger era. Right. Um, and where we're at in North America, you know, our colonies are a very small sliver. And there was this heavy emphasis that most of our enslaved people were born here, um, almost to say it was less bad. To than, enslave children. Right. Right. For generations. <laughs> to say they were born here, we didn't steal them and bring them on a boat, um, is kind of what it felt like. Sort of making a difference between slaves born in mm-hmm. the United States and those born in Africa and suggesting somehow that slave life, that, that our moral debt is less because they were born into slavery as opposed to snatched from their homes. Yes, that's definitely how I felt they were portraying this information. And also that less than 4% of slavery in the Western Hemisphere was in colonial America. Is that to minimize the number of slaves that were here, which still numbered in the millions? I believe so. This slide says two-thirds of the founders held slaves. Even those that held slaves did not defend the institution of slavery. In November 1789, Benjamin Franklin described slavery as an atrocious debasement of human nature. Did they give you the source of the two-thirds of the founders? They did not. Who didn't even approve of slavery? Yeah, they did not, which was odd because there was this heavy focus on primary sources. Um, And so to be given the information without the source, how can I take that back Um, other than in my head? (laughs) You know, how can I take that back to my students in a tangible way if I'm supposed to be relaying this information to them? And then, this is a slide you were talking about. George Washington saying, it being among my first wishes to see some plan adopted by which slavery in this country may be abolished by law, the abolition of domestic slavery is the great object of desire in those colonies where it was unhappily introduced in their infant state. Right. So what's happening here? Well, these are two men that, you know, are known to be slave owners. You know, Thomas Jefferson and the people he enslaved, it's it's notorious, you know, it's a huge topic of discussion. So it, it's really interesting to see them position these two specific figures with quotes that aren't sourced, um, saying they opposed slavery, knowing they own slaves. They own slaves. And, and at least one of them raped a slave. Right. 
But this seems to be the framing here, which is that slave owning in America wasn't as bad as it was mm -hmm. elsewhere. The slaves that were owned were born into slavery. Right. And the people who owned them did so reluctantly. Right. My next guest is the person to talk about the teaching of history and race in America. He has been a longtime staff writer at The New Yorker, providing analysis on everything from politics to policing. During his time at The New Yorker, he has also co-edited The Matter of Black Lives, a collection of the magazine's most groundbreaking pieces on black history and culture, featuring the works of renowned writers like James Baldwin and Toni Morrison. He has also authored numerous books, reported for a Peabody award-winning documentary series. Oh, and he has also recently been named the dean of the Columbia School of Journalism. Joining us now is the great Jelani Cobb. Thank you, Professor, for joining me. Thank you. So there is a lot to talk about There's here. A lot. a lot. I want to start with that slide um, that seems to minimize America's role in the transatlantic slave and this notion that descent-based slavery was somehow perhaps better or less morally uh, egregious mm -hmm. than um, the initial uh, slave boats that brought slaves over to the, um, to the new world, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, Sociologist and law professor Dorothy Roberts explains right. what descent-based mm -hmm. slavery actually meant in the Americas. Well, the, the short word is breeding. Yes. But breeding human beings like, li like livestock. Yes, and I'll read a quote from her book, right? So Virginia decides that enslaved black women give birth to enslavable children even if those children are white. And she writes, that law allowed white men to profit from their sexual assaults on black women. Freed from the worry that their mixed race offspring had any legal claim to freedom, white men could rape enslaved women with total impunity, maintaining their domination while increasing their wealth. Their control over black women's bodies was key to creating a permanent labor supply. That's right. That reality has no place in the civics training. What, what does this mean? Uh, practically speaking? I mean, practically speaking, it is uh, a mechanism by which lies can be given uh, the cloak of truth. Uh, and so if we want to go back to that document about there only being 4% of the people brought in transatlantic slave trade to the North American co colonies, that's technically true. Uh, what they don't talk about is the fact that the British were late to the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and so when we talk about 1619 um, and the 1619 project, that's more than a century after people, particularly the Spanish and the Portuguese, had been bringing enslaved people to Brazil, had been bringing them to the Caribbean, had been bringing them throughout South America. That's why there were fewer. Uh, and so when you get to the other part about the descent-based slavery versus trafficking uh, and kidnapping people, that is motivated by the small thing called the Haitian Revolution, which sent shockwaves throughout the slaveholding world, where Haiti, uh, this island which was overwhelmingly populated by enslaved black people, launched a revolution and overthrew their French uh, overseers. And this terrified slaveholders throughout the West. And so you began to see a push to say that there needed to be an abolition, not of slavery, mm -hmm. but specifically an abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. Yes. Because places like South Carolina already had a majority black population. There were more black people in South Carolina than there were white people in South Carolina. This made people paranoid. And so they ended the transatlantic slave trade and then uh, continued to keep the people enslaved and through the process of uh, reproduction which led to people being bred like livestock, as I said earlier. Uh, and so they are uh, in the using a cloak of humanity mm -hmm. to disguise utter inhumanity. I wonder, you know, when you look at these moments when you have uh, the sort of white patriarchs offering a revisionist history, lost cause, uh, you know, at the after the Civil War. And again, this sort of revisionist history and white uh, apol apologia for like white enslavement mm -hmm. uh, happens again in the civil rights era when we feel like progress is being made. Do you think that's what's happening now? That the, 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 the DeSantis's of the world, that the you know organizations that are working to implement this kind of teaching in schools are doing so because they feel like progress is on the doorstep? Absolutely. This is the, the old dictum that he who controls the past controls the present. Uh, he who controls the present controls the future. It's kind of very uh, kind of gender skewed analysis of that. But still, uh, the, the battle over the past is always about the present, and it's about rationalizing a particular state of affairs.
that are that we see in the world right now. And so if you can diminish the claim of what racism and white supremacy have done in the society, you uh, automatically and implicitly diminish the moral claim that people who are the descendants of those groups have in this country right now. Uh, and so that's what the ball game is right now. And also, if you can muddy the waters yeah. about how difficult it has been for people to achieve citizenship, you can do things that make it more difficult for them to gain access to the vote. Uh, and so all of these things about, are about rationalizing present policies. It is Thursday, the 18th of August of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Okay, well, um, as I had foretold yesterday and earlier in the week as well, um, we have to take our mom (laughs) to some more tests and pre-op protocols today and this morning. So uh, we may have a few longer clips than usual, and we're going to abbreviate the morning rant because we're going to get right into the news read here in a moment. But uh, uh, she seems to be doing okay, except, darn her, she took a couple of tumbles yesterday. Once before we went to a uh, a pre-op class, a class to tell you what you need to do in terms of the soaps they want you to use to uh, keep down bacteria and all that, Uh, some some uh, hydrolyte type uh, electrolyte electrolyte type drinks for her to drink uh, the day of the surgery and the day before and some other things that we needed to know so before we went to that class she had taken a little tumble and uh, it was okay I mean it was nearby and of course when she took a tumble again when we got back I was right there tried to catch her and for some reason she wanted to twist away from me I have no idea But in the process, she ripped up her arm pretty bad because her skin is gossamer thin. And now I'm worried that uh, because it got ripped pretty bad, will it uh, be healed enough by her surgery so that we don't have an issue with MRSA and all the other issues. So we'll see. Uh, She's in, I mean, the reason she falls is because her hip won't support her. And I don't know why she's very, very stubborn. You try to get her to use the walker, she, you know, won't do it. You try to get her to use the cane, then she goes, I can't remember where I put my cane. Well, you should have it in your hand. I wheel her around in a wheelchair everywhere we go now because, you know, she can't really get around that easily. So, I don't know. What do you do when your mom is not really the best patient in the world? (laughs) Fights with you every inch of the way. Hey, mom, you got to use your cane. Hey, mom, you got to use your walker. (laughs) Okay, well, we'll see how it goes. We have to go to uh, get some sort of uh, heart echo test today. And then um, uh, we go to the pre-op surgical nurse with uh, the, the nurse. For the actual surgeon, we meet with her after this uh, echo test. And we'll see how it goes. But how it is going at this very moment here in the salon we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is that we are going to give, going to give you a rundown on what we have in store for you today. Well, at the top, the new DeSantis-ordered Florida teacher training downplays the role of slavery in U.S. history, and you know why. Yes, you do. On the rest of the menu, Weisselberg's plea deal could make Trump a prosecution witness. We can only hope. Alex Jones' lawyer faces a disciplinary hearing in Connecticut. And Oregon's chief justice denied that a personality conflict led her to fire all members of a commission that governs the Office of Public Defense Services. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where a U.N. investigator reported that contemporary forms of slavery are widely practiced around the world. And Saudi Arabia 
sentenced a woman to 34 years in prison over her critical Twitter activity. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, who is at this very moment in Pittsburgh for Netroots Nation 22. So stay tuned for some great content. I'm sure we're going to have enough uh, by this weekend, if not sooner. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, Kelly. If you would look across from that chat room link uh, near the bottom of our homepage at Netrootsradio.com to the left, you will notice our Patreon link, and if you could afford to send us an espresso-type coffee drink, how about what you might spend? Even better, huh? Don't send us the drink. Send us the money that you would spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month. That's how you become a Patreon of Netroots Radio. It really does help us pay our bills, and then we can fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance, as we have been resisting 24-7, 365, for over 11 years. 11! My gosh. If you would, oh, and thank you for your generosity in allowing us to uh, fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. So you can find those show notes and links by going to my Twitter feed because the link to the page that has all the show notes and links for each show daily is right there. And that's how you do it. So follow me at Justice Putnam. Follow the show at Twitter, on Twitter at Cookbook West, and you can pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 and uh, the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library for over these more than 11 years can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Okay. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Michael R. Sisek. The chief financial officer of Trump's company, Alan Weiselberg, or is it Weiselberg, is expected to plead guilty to tax violations today in a deal that would require him to testify about illicit business practices at the Trump Organization. Two people familiar with the matter told the AP. Weiselberg is charged with accepting more than $1.7 million in off-the-books compensation from Trump's company over several years, including untaxed perks like rent, car payments, and school tuition. The plea deal would require Weiselberg to speak in court today about the company's role in the compensation arrangement and possibly serve as a witness when the Trump organization goes on trial in October on related criminal charges. Weiselberg, age 75, is likely to receive a sentence of five months in jail to be served at New York City's notorious Rikers Island and he could be required to pay about $2 million in restitution, including taxes, penalties, and interest. If that punishment holds, Weiselberg would be eligible for release after about 100 days. Messengers, or messages seeking comment, were left with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and lawyers for Weiselberg and the Trump Organization. 
Wazelberg is the only person to face criminal charges so far in the Manhattan District Attorney's long-running investigation of the company's business practices. Seen as one of Trump's most loyal business associates, Wieselberg was arrested in July of 2021. His lawyers have argued the Democrat-led district attorney's office was punishing him because he would not offer information that would damage Trump. Really? The district attorney has also been investigating whether Trump or his company lied to banks or the government about the value of his properties to obtain loans or reduce tax bills. Then District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr., who started the investigation last year, directed his deputies to present evidence to a grand jury and seek an, indict an indictment of Trump, according to former prosecutor Mark Pomerantz, who previously led the probe. But after Vance left office, his successor, Alvin Bragg, allowed the grand jury to disband without charges. Both prosecutors are Democrats. Bragg has said the investigation is continuing. The Trump organization is not involved in Wazelberg's expected guilty plea on today and is scheduled to be tried in the alleged compensation scheme in October. Prosecutors allege the company gave untaxed fringe benefits to senior executives, including Weiselberg, for 15 years. Weiselberg alone was accused of defrauding the federal government, the state, and city out of more than $900,000 in unpaid taxes and undeserved tax refunds. Under state law, punishment for the most serious charge against Weiselberg, grand larceny, could carry a penalty as high as 15 years in prison. But the charge carries no mandatory minimum, and most first-time offenders in tax-related cases never end up behind bars, especially if they're rich and white. The tax fraud charges against the Trump Organization are punishable by a fine of double the amount of unpaid taxes of $250,000, or whichever is larger. Trump has not been charged in the criminal probe. The Republican has decried the New York investigation as a political witch hunt has said his company's actions were standard practice in the real estate business and in no way a crime. Hey, I got to tell you, those standard business practices, Donnie, are a crime. Last week, Trump sat for a deposition in New York Attorney General Letitia James' parallel civil investigation into allegations Trump's company misled lenders and tax authorities about asset values. Trump invoked his Fifth Amendment protection against self-incrimination more than 440 times. Dave Collins of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A lawyer for conspiracy theorist Alex Jones is facing scrutiny from a Connecticut judge who began hearing testimony yesterday, Wednesday, on whether the lawyer should be disciplined for giving other attorneys for Jones highly sensitive documents, including medical records of relatives of victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Attorney Norman Pattis is representing Jones in a defamation lawsuit filed by Sandy Hook families against Jones for calling the 2012 shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, a hoax. 21st graders and six educators were killed. 
The Connecticut trial is separate from a trial in Texas that ended earlier this month with a jury awarding more than $49 million to the parents of one of the slain children. There's also a second lawsuit against Jones in Texas by Sandy Hook families over the hoax claims. Pattis, who did not testify yesterday, Wednesday, has denied violating Judge Barbara Bellis's order in the case to not disclose confidential documents to unauthorized people. Pattis said he was confident in our defense in a brief response to an email seeking comment. A lawyer for the Sandy Hook families, Christopher Matai, testified that Pattis sent him a text in which Pattis said he may have violated the document disclosure order. After a couple of hours of testimony before Bellis in Waterbury, Connecticut, the hearing was continued to next week. Jury selection before Bellis is set to resume today for a trial on how much in damages Jones should pay the families. Bellis found him liable for damages last November. According to court documents, Pattis sent a large number of records from the Connecticut defamation case within the past month to the lawyer representing Jones in Texas in the similar lawsuits by Sandy Hook parents over the hoax claims, as well as a bankruptcy case for one of Jones' companies. It has not been made clear what documents Pattis allegedly sent, but from what has emerged from court documents, lawyer comments and the Texas lawsuit, they appear to have included confidential medical records of some of the Sandy Hook victims' relatives, as well as texts from Jones' cell phone. Jones' attorneys in Texas mistakenly sent the last two years' worth of texts from Jones' cell phone an attorney for a Sandy Hook family, or to the family, in a recently completed Texas case, Jones said he didn't have any texts about Sandy Hook. Legal experts say that episode could open Jones up to possible perjury charges. of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A lawyer for conspiracy theorist Alex Jones is facing scrutiny from a Connecticut judge who began hearing testimony yesterday, Wednesday, on whether the lawyer should be disciplined for giving other attorneys for Jones highly sensitive documents, including medical records of relatives of victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Attorney Norman Pattis is representing Jones in a defamation lawsuit filed by Sandy Hook families against Jones for calling the 2012 shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, a hoax. 20 first graders and six educators were killed. The Connecticut trial is separate from a trial in Texas that ended earlier this month with a jury awarding more than $49 million to the parents of one of the slain children. There's also a second lawsuit against Jones in Texas by Sandy Hook families over the hoax claims. Pattis, who did not testify yesterday, Wednesday, has denied violating Judge Barbara Bellis's order in the case to not disclose confidential documents to unauthorized people. Pattis said he was confident in our defense in a brief response to an email seeking comment. A lawyer for the Sandy Hook families, Christopher Matai, testified that Pattis sent him a text in which Pattis said he may have violated the document disclosure order. 
After a couple of hours of testimony before Bellis in Waterbury, Connecticut, the hearing was continued to next week. Jury selection before Bellis is set to resume today for a trial on how much in damages Jones should pay the families. Bellis found him liable for damages last November. According to court documents, Pata sent a large number of records from the Connecticut defamation case within the past month to the lawyer representing Jones in Texas in the similar lawsuits by Sandy Hook parents over the hoax claims, as well as a bankruptcy case for one of Jones' companies. It has not been made clear what documents Pat has allegedly sent, but from what has emerged from court documents, lawyer comments, and the Texas lawsuit, they appear to have included confidential medical records of some of the Sandy Hook victims' relatives, as well as texts from Jones' cell phone. Jones' attorneys in Texas mistakenly sent the last two years' worth of texts from Jones' cell phone, an attorney for a Sandy Hook family, or to the family, in a recently completed Texas case, Jones said he didn't have any texts about Sandy Hook. Legal experts say that episode could open Jones up to possible perjury charges. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Every year, the Cancer Community Award, sponsored by AstraZeneca, presents an individual or organization with the Catalyst for Change Award. This award celebrates those who significantly improve access to cancer care for underserved populations. In 2021, Tama Hargraves received the award for her work as a volunteer for the Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina. She developed their Access to Care Gas Card program, which helps patients travel to their treatment. As we prepared for this year's awards, we reconnected with Tama to learn more about what's happened since she received the award. Well, Tama Hargraves, it's such a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you and catch up on everything you've been doing over the past year. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So for people who don't know your story, do you mind briefly talking about your personal cancer journey? Sure. It's a 15-year cancer journey. And I was diagnosed in 2006 with stage 3B non-small cell lung cancer. I participated in a very aggressive clinical trial for nine months, and it was initially successful. I did go out of remission three years later, had a little more treatment, had a craniotomy along the way, and 15 years later, I now am so educated about lung cancer. I know that I have a mutation that I didn't know when I was diagnosed, and I believe that I'm still here. I'm supposed to share my journey so other people can have the same experience I've had. They said your survival rate at one point was maybe 15%. Correct. I think we're up to 21 now. (laughs) Unlike a lot of people who say they don't want cancer to define them, you said that cancer does define you. So what do you mean by that? When I looked at the statistics and when I learned about lung cancer, and then I found out that it was the least funded of all cancers, but it's the number one cancer killer, and that more women are getting lung cancer now, I thought, as long as I'm a survivor of this, I need to do something with this to help our cause. So everything just kind of fell into place here, having an organization right here in Raleigh and being very close to um, and working, volunteering at my hospital. And I just felt that I needed to give back and I needed to do something to help support more lung cancer research and lung cancer patients as well. So that's just part of who I am. (laughs) You were behind creating a a gas card for cancer patients to get to their treatments. Where did that idea come from? Well, by then I was on the board of directors for the Lung Cancer Initiative. And 
quite honestly and selfishly, I had raised a lot of money for them with the fundraising and our 5Ks and all that. And we were funding wonderful research and young investigators and all of these things. But I finally brought it up at the meeting. I said, what are we doing directly for patients? And we really hadn't been doing anything at that point directly. After volunteering at the hospital, and now, of course, with the gas price is so high. I thought, what about gas cards for our patients? And they were very willing to fund that program. And so it really was my idea, but without the Lung Cancer Initiative, it probably would have never happened because they implemented it. The requests for the gas cards go into them and they send it directly out to the patients from all different cancer centers. So it may seem like a small thing to some people, but it's a big thing to patients. And like my oncologist said, if they can't get to treatment, we can't help them. Do you have any sense of how many people have been helped by this gas card program? I think the last statistic that I heard from our uh, president, Amy, was over 2,500 people. You know, they budget it. So I think they're going to try to do another 500 this year. It's probably closer to 3,000 now, but to me, that's significant. We still have to get the word out in the state because a lot of people still don't know about our organization. We try really hard, but they don't know about LCI. So we're working on it. For some of us who live in cities, the nearest hospital is just a, a quick ride away. Why are these gas carts so important where you are? Well, there's a lot of rural areas in North Carolina. So these people may get diagnosed by their primary care doctor and then get referred to the cancer centers. Now, it's really important that we get these people in so they can participate in clinical trials. That's how we're going to get better with our lung cancer treatment. So it's really important. How far do some patients have to travel to get to their care? You know, a lot of people come from the mountains, which is probably three hours away. We have other people who come up from Wilmington or the beach areas, and that can be three or four hours as well. Can you tell me about a specific person who was affected by this program, who benefited from the gas cards? It's interesting because a lot of times I don't know actually who applies for the cards. The nurse navigators, like the one that I work with at UNC, um, she'll fill out the application and just send them in. Sometimes now with the work that I do at the hospital, I'll actually go in and talk to the patients. I'm not a medical advisor. I'm more of an emotional support. But one of the things I'll ask them is if, could you use a gas card? And of course, most of them say yes. I met one this past week when I was volunteering at UNC and I walked, when I walked into the room, he said, oh, we've talked before and you got me that gas card. And I said, well, I told you about it. I said, well, could you use another one? He goes, yeah, we could. What the sign to me was this man was still surviving with lung cancer and I had known him like a year now. So uh, that was exciting. And he was so enthused about it and happy about it. So it was a good thing. <laughs> What did it mean for you to be nominated and then win the Catalyst for Change Award? I was totally shocked. And you may have heard the story. I kept getting um, emails from the C2 people. The cancer community people? <laughs> yes. And I, I thought it was junk mail. So I was just deleting it. And finally, I got an email and it said, I, I, I need to check and see if you're getting these emails. And I'm like, well, what is this? Well, I didn't know that the Lung Cancer Initiative had nominated me for it. They never told me. <laughs> so I, I went, yes, I'm getting them. And he says, okay, great. And so then I actually got in touch with the folks at LCI and I said, did you nominate me for something? And they started laughing and they said, well, yeah, but we didn't know it was, this was going to happen so fast. I was honored, of course, but I thought, oh, I'll never win this. There's, you know, so many other wonderful things going on. And then they told me that I was a finalist. And then I won the award and I was like, oh, my gosh. What was the reaction among the people that you work with at the Lung Cancer Initiative when you won this award? Uh, 
they were so thrilled. They all just love me now. <laughs> How has uh, this award impacted your work? Oh, well, it, it's impacted it quite a bit. But um, I think the one thing that has come out of it is that it has been put out there publicly. And so I was asked to speak at different organizations about LCI and bring the word out about lung cancer on a local level. I think that's the first podcast I've done, but I've done a couple of other things, interviews. You know, there are a lot of wonderful people out there with great stories. Mine's just one of many, but nothing else if it brings more a more of a vision for our program and for other people to get enthused about something as awful as lung cancer. It's kept me busy. <laughs> I understand that you're now a judge. So without telling us too much, what has struck you about the, the nominees this year? Yeah, the judging, it's hard because almost, well, every single one of them to me offered great you know, resources or did wonderful things. I mean, I really had a hard time because everybody was deserving. They really were. <laughs> Just sort of reflecting on your own cancer journey and all the interactions you've had with other patients, what would you say to someone else who is going through a similar journey? Is there any advice or, or counsel you would offer? Here's what's happened with me is being able to do what I'm doing at the hospital and I go into a room and my nurse navigator will say there's someone else in this room who's had lung cancer and they're looking around because I mean look at me I look pretty healthy and so she'll say well she did and their eyes get really big and then I'll say yeah 15 years ago and then their eyes get really big and so I always say to them you can never give up hope because somebody's got to be in that 20% survival rate and it might as well be you. So that's what we try to encourage. It's hard though. It can be very, very depressing. And I remember having some major pity parties through treatment. It's hard to be positive when it's not a really well-funded or well understood cancer. So that's what we're working towards. Tama Hargraves, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Megan. It was wonderful seeing you. Tama Hargraves is a volunteer for the Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina. In 2021, she received the Catalyst for Change Award from the Cancer Community Awards, part of the AstraZeneca Your Cancer Program. Your Cancer brings together the community that is working to drive meaningful change in cancer care. Visit yourcancer.org to learn more about the C2 Award winners and the Your Cancer program. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Hey, kids and parents, it's back to school time. As you shop for school supplies and get ready for class, make sure you have emergency plans in place. Did you know that emergency preparedness plays a major role in school life? Throughout the year, schools actively prepare for natural disasters, outbreaks, and other emergency situations. Students and parents need to be aware and learn what to do during an emergency. Every family should build an emergency kit, make a family disaster plan, and be informed about events that could affect their community. Parents, take a few extra steps to help children be prepared. Make sure they know the full name, address, and phone numbers of parents or guardians. In our high-tech world of cell phones, memorizing emergency phone numbers is very important. Include a copy of this information in their backpack. Other items to keep in their backpack include water and non-perishable snacks, a pocket-sized first aid kit, a whistle to alert others for help, and a list of allergies, medical conditions, and medications. Make sure their school and teacher have a copy, too. Be familiar with different routes and ways to travel home, like walking, taking the bus, or riding home with another student who lives nearby. Establish a secret code word with your child and whoever takes them home from school to protect against an unauthorized person picking them up. This list is a great starting point to prepare your student for the upcoming school year. Customize these steps to fit your child's capabilities and needs. Ask school administrators and teachers about emergency preparedness plans 
so you know what steps they are taking to keep your child safe. Many schools have guidelines on how to shelter in place during natural disasters, how to secure classrooms during an emergency lockdown, and how to teach preparedness curriculum to students. Remember, emergency preparedness is important for everyone. Children who are prepared are more confident during stressful emergency situations. By following preparedness guidelines, parents, children, and school staff can improve their safety and peace of mind. For more information on school emergency preparedness, visit cdc.gov/children/schools. To learn more about disasters and emergency preparedness, follow at CDC Emergency on Twitter or visit emergency.cdc.gov. So let's get prepared. Have a great school year. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call one eight hundred CDC Info. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, ask your healthcare provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on a minute of health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call one eight hundred CDC info. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution so donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Senator Joe Manchin, a one-man political steamroller in Washington, is a Democrat, except when he's not, which is most of the time. A multimillionaire West Virginia coal executive, he's the darling of fossil fuel and pipeline lobbyists and beloved by Republican opponents of progressive Democratic policies. Indeed, he's funded by Republican billionaires. But Washington lobbyists and billionaires are not the only source of personal political power that allows him to hold office and block little-d democratic policies that the American majority wants and needs. Back home, Joe has maintained tight authoritarian grip on West Virginia's Democratic Party structure, rigging the rules to put little Joes in each and every party position. In turn, this has long given Boss Manchin control over who gets to run as Democrats for down-ballot elected offices in the Mountain State? Until June 18, that is. That's when a statewide Democratic rebellion that had been organizing for six years elected its slate of over 50 candidates to oust the Manchinites on the party executive committee, replacing all but one of the top party officials with grassroots activists. It truly was a diverse, people-run victory. Selena Vickers, a social worker, was chief strategist, and Mike Pushkin, a cab driver, is now the party chair. Danielle Walker, now vice chair of the committee and the first person of color in state history to sit on the party's governing body, summed up the significance of this turnaround. There's a new beacon of light shining down on the government with people energized and ready to strategize with a return to the democratic process. This is Jim Hightower saying... To help bring this kind of progressive reform to your local or state Democratic Party, 
Go to Our Revolution, the one national group working on this fundamental democratic change to the Democratic Party. OurRevolution.com Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1945. That was the day President Truman appointed a fact-finding panel to investigate the General Motors strike. As many as 320,000 UAW GM workers had been on strike for nearly three weeks. They had suffered deep wage cuts, deteriorating working conditions, and endless contract violations during the war. The UAW workers now demanded a 30% wage increase. But President Truman and GM acted as if it was still wartime. Truman ordered a 30-day cooling-off period to be followed by compulsory arbitration. Just two days earlier, 10,000 strikers picketed GM, encircling their downtown headquarters for over an hour. The CIO held an emergency conference vowing to continue and spread the strike. CIO President Philip Murray took to the radio in defense of the strike. He noted that corporations had made millions in wartime profits, that wage cuts since VJ Day had been as high as 50% and denounced Congress for burdensome new tax laws. Murray added that Truman's proposed Fact-Finding Act and other anti-labor laws served to, quote, weaken and ultimately to destroy labor union organizations. Bob Carter, chairman of the AC Spark Plug Strike Committee and chairman of the Greater Flint CIO Council, remarked, I am against arbitration and will oppose the setting up of fact-finding committees. Anyone acquainted with the labor history of this country knows that those committees are used by political stooges of the corporations to to cheat workers out of their just demands. The strike ended in partial victory the following March, with strikers winning a 17.5% raise, just over half their original demand. But UAW members demonstrated their solidarity and their refusal to be cowed into going back to work on the government's terms. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 70 degrees already. We are still in a heat advisory until about midnight tonight. Had, a, had temperatures of 110 right outside the front door here at the mothership yesterday. And though we're supposed to be 100 degrees today, I think it might be more around 106. Sunshine and clouds mixed with winds light and variable. Generally clear skies tonight with lows in the mid-60s, winds light and variable. I should add... There was thunderstorm activity and flash flood warnings in parts of the adjoining counties, including Jackson, yesterday. And it is quite overcast now and feels like lightning and thunder weather. So we'll see how that turns out. Abundant sunshine tomorrow with lows, I mean, I'm sorry, highs in the low 90s. Oh, it's going to cool off. Winds will be out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have been updated. Our confirmed cases have increased to 495,093 confirmed cases with deceased increasing by 2 to 570. Pollen is is uh, rated low, which would be grass pollen here in Rogue River itself. The air quality index for the region is good 
at the upper end of good at 46 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is high at level 7. Barometric pressure is rising at 29.93 inches, visibility is up to 9 miles, and relative humidity is at 75%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 80 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 83 and sunny. Rome is 92 and partly cloudy with thunderstorm activity that could impact critical infrastructure like the electrical grid. Uh, Kiev is 85 and sunny. Kabul is 70 degrees and cloudy. Hong Kong is 84 and fair. Tokyo is 81 and fair. Sydney, Australia is 58 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 52 and mostly cloudy with a small craft advisory again on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York is 78 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. M. Letterer of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A U.N. investigator says contemporary forms of slavery are widely practiced around the world, including forced labor for China's Uyghur minority, bonded labor for the lowest caste Dalits in South Asia, and domestic servitude in Gulf countries, Brazil and Colombia. Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur Tomoya Obagata adds that traditional enslavement, especially of minorities, is found in Mauritania, Mali, and Niger in Africa's Sahel region. He said in a report to the UN General Assembly circulated yesterday, Wednesday, that child labor, another contemporary form of slavery, exists in all regions of the world, including its worst forms. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Sarah Dadouche and Annabelle Timsit of the Washington Post brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Saudi Arabia quietly sentenced a woman last week to 34 years in prison over her Twitter activity, marking the longest Saudi sentence ever for a peaceful activist and launching a fresh wave of fear among the government's detractors. The woman, Salma al-Sahab, was detained in January of 2021 in Saudi Arabia, where she was on vacation days before the Saudi citizen and mother of two was set to return to her home in Britain. The charges against the 32-year-old all revolved around her Twitter activity, according to court documents. Sahab had been active on the social media platform during campaigns demanding demanding the abolition of the country's guardianship system, which gives men legal control over aspects of female relatives' lives. She had called 
for the freeing of Saudi prisoners of conscience. According to court records obtained by the Post, Shahab was accused of using a social media website to, quote, disrupt public order, undermine the security of society and stability of the state, and, st- and support those who had committed criminal actions, according to the counterterrorism law and its financing. Uh huh. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver